I guess some people think of Modern Life is Goodish as a show where I highlight some of the silly things people do online. And so, to some extent, that can put people on edge. Like this person, for example, <laughs> who tweeted, I live in fear of one of my tweets <laughs> appearing on Dave Gorman's <laughs> Modern Life is Rubbish. <laughs> Well, you don't need to worry about that, because it won't appear on Modern Life is Rubbish, because there's no such show, <laughs> is there? Here's another one. At Dave Gorman. Modern Life is not goodish. It's shit. <laughs> and getting worse daily. It's a bit bleak, isn't it? And look, I know that life doesn't treat everyone well, and that times are tough for a lot of people, but if you're telling me that, using your handheld electronic device that can instantly access all of the information in the world, but can also be used to order a pizza, Maybe you have to concede that at least some of modern life <laughs> is good-ish, at least. His tweet continues. Too many snowflakes. Oh, he's one of the snowflake people. <laughs> Too many snowflakes telling us what we can and can't do or say. You can't say that. <laughs> oh, no, no, you can, actually, you can. <laughs> if you want. I mean, I'm not sure it's true, but I can't stop you saying it. Well, I, I don't know what this person's background is. I, I don't know what it is they think they can't say anymore. But I don't think there's anything you can't say anymore. I think there are consequences for saying things. I think it's true that, that people are more easily moved to outrage these days, that people are more vocal about being upset, and I know that might feel exhausting at times, but in a way, isn't that a sign that things are getting better, not worse? Anyway, this chap did send another tweet ten minutes later, which might cast a bit more light on his particular beef. Nobody can take a joke anymore. No banter. The old days were better. And I should know, I was a pharmacist. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the unique insight of an ex-pharmacist. <laughs> of course. I think this is about people struggling to keep up with the shift in our cultural standards. And the easiest way of demonstrating quite how far things have changed is to watch one of those nostalgia TV shows, like, say, you know, the sort of thing, we remember the 70s and so on but just to see what the celebs of today have to say about the media of then. For my money, Paul Ross is the king of that particular show. He's got such a facility for language. This is a clip of him talking about a 1970s perfume ad. Uh, he is about to use a phrase that I've never heard before, that you have never heard before, and yet we are all going to know exactly what he means. Are you saying, basically, that if you give a bottle of perfume, you're going to get your hat blown? <laughs> If you give her a bottle of perfume, you're gonna get your hat blown. Absolutely. <laughs> the message in that ad, the message in the ad he's talking about is actually worse than that. This is the ad he was talking about, okay? It's for a perfume called La Vie Moderne by Godwin. And this is the message of the ad. When a girl knows what she wants, La Vie Moderne, Godwin. Take in the details here. When a girl knows what she wants. When a girl knows what a man wants. La vie moderne, Godwin. When a girl knows what a man wants, presumably to get his end away. <laughs> and then finally. Let your man know that what he wants isn't free. <laughs> and I think your reaction to that ad rather proves my earlier point about a shift in moral attitudes over time. I don't think that's as simple as buy her a bottle of perfume and get your hat blown. <laughs> I think that's saying, you know you're going to put out, but if you're wearing this perfume, you'll know you're a classy bird, so we'll buy your dinner first. <laughs> that is a terrible message to send to young women and an even worse one to send to young men. That ad wouldn't go out today. Of course it wouldn't, as the master of reminiscence TV puts it. How on earth can that work? How could that get by any advertising standards agency? Exactly, Paul. Now, obviously, I don't think all change is good. I don't think pursuing change for the sake of change is necessarily wise, and I'm not alone in that belief. The best argument I've seen against change for the sake of change came, as you'd probably expect, in an episode of Thomas the Tank Engine. Uh, <laughs> this is from Thomas and Friends, and we join the action as Edward has a question for the Fat Controller. What's happening? I've splashed out on a new public address system. <laughs> But Edward has another question. Oh? Uh, what was wrong with the old one? Was it broken? Was there a reason for replacing it? Uh huh. Uh oh. Sorry. Oh, nothing wrong with it, Edward. But this new one is much more modern. 
You see, the fat controller represents the kind of t who camps overnight outside the Apple store trying to get a brand new iPhone on the day of release, doesn't he? <laughs> He's enthralled to modernity for modernity's sake. And you know enough about how children's TV works to know that he's going to learn the error of his ways. He's going to learn that he was a fool to scrap a perfectly good working PA system for no reason whatsoever. At which point, I think it's also then legitimate to ask, well, why have you replaced the old, non-computer-generated, stop-motion, real-life, model train Thomas the Tank Engine with this computer-generated version? What was wrong with the old one? This is controversial, I know, but I think that the update is an improvement. I mean, look, here's a clip from each version, and in both of these, the trains are meant to be going like the clappers. I don't know about you, but I think the modern version down here is much more dynamic and exciting for a child to watch, isn't it? I mean, that train up top is just sort of trundling along, isn't it? <laughs> and yet, in the story, it's meant to be herring along at pace. If you don't believe me, we can run the tape on. Everyone was excited. The fat controller leaned out of the window to wave at Edward and Henry. But the train was going so fast that his hat blew off into a field where a girl dated for two. I'm sorry, I, I apologise, don't you mean that? <laughs> that is another reason, it's another reason why the old one is worse. It's filth! Filth! The fat controller... <laughs> ..getting his hat blown on children's telly, I'm sorry. <laughs> Shouldn't have been allowed, I'm sorry. But it's not just the style of animation that has changed. I think the moral message of the show has changed as well. The old show was really authoritarian. Look, this is a clip from the old show. In this episode, Henry has decided that he doesn't want to go out in the rain and get his paint wet, and so he's sheltering in a tunnel. And they try everything to push and pull him out of the tunnel, but he won't budge. And so eventually, the fat controller decides to punish him. We shall take away your rails, he said and leave you here for always and always and always. And they don't just take the rails away. Oh, no. They took up the old rails and built a wall in front of him so that Henry couldn't get out of the tunnel anymore. They brick him into the tunnel forever! <laughs> and you should have seen the crowd on the other side of this camera as that was happening. Oh, my Build God. That wall. Build 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 that wall. Yeah. It seems America has got its own fat cunt roller as well. Uh, <laughs> so he's bricked in forever. In this version of the show, the fat controller is virtually a fascist. <laughs> Still, you know what they say about fascists, at least they make the trains run on time. Um, <laughs> just listen to Ringo Starr's last words in this episode. He wondered if he would ever be allowed to pull trains again. But I think he deserved his punishment. Don't you? <laughs> Two, three, four. <laughs> this is outrageous! In the modern version, the fat controller is still in charge, but he's much less severe. I don't even need to show you a clip to prove that point. A single still image does the job perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> so, to me, the changes they've made seem to be positive. But, of course, there'll always be reactionary people out there who think it's got worse. I'd expect that. What I didn't expect, amongst the various complaints about the new-look Thomas, was to see the British National Party accusing it of white genocide. <laughs> <laughs> this is the BNP linking to a story from the Daily Mail, which is a bit like being offered a satsuma by an orange. <laughs> not, not that there is anything offensive about the Mail story. They're just putting the facts out there. This isn't the first time the Mail have written about this, as you can see. But, of course, they're not the only people to have picked up on it, and there's been much focus on the ethnically diverse, multicultural rebrand. One of the characters they mention in the headline uh, is Ashima. And I've seen the episode with Ashima in it, and it's brilliant. It's an hour-long musical in which Thomas gets to duet with Ashima. Why do I have to be me? You can is this what I'm really meant to be? Yeah, that is beautiful. That is Thomas regretting that he's not bigger and stronger and more impressive and Ashima telling him that it's OK to just be who you are. Now, according to The Telegraph, the producer insists this has not been done out of political correctness. And you know what? I believe him. If I was an animator, I would rather animate a Bollywood duet with a healthy message than an episode about bricking a train into a tunnel forever. <laughs> But, the producer acknowledges, there are clearly some upset people. And, oh, of course there are. <laughs> and you can believe me, ladies and gentlemen, 
when I tell you the bottom half of the internet has been teeming with them. I've read all of these stories on the topic and many more. I've taken my favourite comments from beneath those stories and turned them into something that I like to call a found poem that I would like to perform for you now. My childhood is ruined. England has simply given up. I'm not being racist, but... <laughs> Thomas the Tank is British. It's called British Rail for a reason. <laughs> and if it's British Rail, it should star British engines. It isn't British Rail. TTTE is set on the fictional island of Sodor. They are not British Rail rolling stock. They belong to the Sodor and Mainland Railway, which later became the North Western Railway. All I know is that when I was a child, trains did not have foreign accents. <laughs> Well, when I was a child, trains didn't talk. <laughs> Once again, this is a case of political correctness going all PC on us. <laughs> I bet it won't be long before we have a transgender train. <laughs> In the real world, no train can have any gender. All trains are gender neutral. As men do not have outward signs of their gender on display, i.e. breasts, <laughs> I think it is natural to assume gender neutral equates to male, but not going on about it. <laughs> A train cannot be trans. End of. What about the Trans-Siberian Express? <laughs> Trains do not have any nationality either. I think you'll find that the backbone of today's freight trains are the North American and Spanish built class 66s and 67s, <laughs> while Virgin's Pendolinos are largely Italian sourced. Of course, most of these foreign locomotives couldn't run on the island of Sodor anyway because of the gauge. <laughs> then what about coupling? Looks like two of them have Buckeye style couplers rather than screwlings. <laughs> and are they air braked or vacuum braked? <laughs> mm -hmm. I say, bring back Ivor the engine. <laughs> Kachushka. Kachushka. Wrong noise, mate. <laughs> Pshhtikov. Pshhtikov. I saw the actual Flying Scotsman once. It was in Australia. <laughs> really? How did it get there? Dunno. 